Good morning, everyone. Welcome to church. Let's stand as we are able and join each other in worshiping the Lord. Here we go. of the blind there's no one like you none like you into the darkness you shine out of the ashes we rise there's no one like you none like you our God is great God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? Then what could stand against? Our God is greater. Our God is stronger, God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God.
God, thank you for a beautiful morning. Thank you for bringing us here to church today. God, we ask that you would help us with humility to hear your voice and what you have to say to us today. And God, would you let our hearts be made into, from hearts of stone um, to hearts of flesh and to hearts that are soft and ready to be molded by you. God, we're grateful for you, and we thank you for your love that we share today. pray this in your name. Amen. Good morning. So there's more of us than there were at 9 o'clock, so that's great. <laughs> I love that. And hello to everybody watching at home. Um, we had a big memorial yesterday, and I think a lot of people are exhausted from it, so they're resting today. So hopefully they're watching online. Friends, I'd like to say welcome. Our hearts are full to see you present and to have you worship with us. And um, I'd like to say the peace of Christ be with you. Please show one another signs of greeting. And online you can do that in the chat, uh, Facebook or YouTube, okay? Uh, good morning, everybody. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Every day is a blessing. Never forget that. Um, I'm Lisa. I'm your 9 o'clock lay leader. Hello to everybody at home watching. Uh, 
please make sure that uh, you read the bulletin that you got, got when you came in. Um, if you're at home, make sure you check your e-newsletter uh, for all the uh, activities and uh, events that are happening in our church body. Uh, some things that are coming up uh, today at 12 o'clock, we're having our second um, Moving the Church Forward meeting. That's at noon uh, here in the Heritage Hall. They're going to be serving a light lunch. So for those who are kind of interested in seeing how our church, not only our church, but our two sisters' churches too, how we work together to move our faith forward and our community forward. So please, hopefully, if you can make it for that at 12 today, that would be great. Uh, we have uh, some big events coming up. Uh, September 11th is going to be like a fun Sunday. We're only having one service that day at 10 o'clock up in the sanctuary. Afterwards, we're going to have games and just a lot of different activities, kind of just celebrating uh, the summer ending and getting back to school and stuff like that. So that is September 11th. So that's, uh, that's coming up pretty soon. And the week after that, the 18th, we call that Music Celebration Sunday. Uh, so we're having both our 9 and 1030 service at that time. So, so a couple of special Sundays that are coming up real soon. Uh, Michael Naylor is our, our leader for our houseless ministry. Uh, he has a, uh, they're going out this Saturday to help those uh, the houseless people down toward downtown Long Beach. They're always in need of fast food gift cards. And also if you can make, maybe throw an extra few dollars in our coffee and donuts offering, um, all that money goes to buying necessities for these people. And the uh, gift cards you can get through Script right here after church. Uh, just, I think they have five and ten dollar gift cards, I believe. So if you could help out with that, that really helps Michael's ministry. Michael's right here, if you're not sure. His phone number and contact information is in the bulletin if you have more questions about that. Really neat if you this almost takes up an entire page in our bulletin, our foundation, our uh, Los Altos United Methodist Church Foundation was able to gift over $42,000 toward different projects that are happening in our church, all the way from Habitat for Humanity to painting are, are some of our buildings. So it's so wonderful that um, this foundation works to help our church uh, grow and sustain itself. September 7th, we all know it's coming. That's everyone's end. That's Wednesday night. Uh, we show up around 6, and we're done around 7.30, quarter to 8. Great time to fellowship. We get a, a meal. We have small group, we have large group, we have music. It's just a lot of fun. So if you haven't been to one, uh, please think about attending. And if you're already uh, looking forward to it, good for you, just like I am. Uh, also, our uh, ch all church camp is coming up at the end of September. I know that kind of seems a little far away, but it's actually only like six weeks away. So it's coming very quickly. So we're please be uh, prepared for that. You want to sign up. Remember, everything that we do is on our um it's beingthechurchlb.org. That's our website. And we also have an app. You could uh, go to your uh, Google store or your Apple application store, and you can find our app where you can find all kinds of information about what our church is doing. Hope everybody has a great day. So I just want to start uh, the welcoming the children piece with giving a shout out to Ursula our child care person. Um, she supervises crafts and um, play uh, over here at the table. And so parents with kids, come on in. We have room for you at the table. And there's always a craft, but of course the kids are welcome to, if they don't feel like doing the craft, they're welcome to draw and do other things. But um, I borrowed the craft that they're doing today um, because uh, it's such a wonderful craft for our um, for our story today. So here's Jesus. And here is our bent over woman. There once was a woman who was bent over. She could not stand up straight no matter how bright the sun was. She had difficulty looking at it. No matter how many stars were in the sky, she had difficulty seeing them. When people talked to her, she had difficulty seeing their faces. So after a while, some people just didn't talk to her at all. When she went to the well to get water, she could fill her jug, but it was hard to walk with the full jar. 
Water kept sloshing out on her feet, so after a while she stopped going to the well to get water at all. When she went to the market, it was hard to carry a full basket of fruit. Figs and grapes kept slipping out of the basket, so after a while the woman stopped going to the market at all. One Sabbath day, she was visiting the synagogue. She shuffled inside and sat down. Soon the woman heard a voice calling to her. She tried to look up, but it was difficult. And again, she heard the voice, the voice of Jesus. Jesus noticed how bent over she was with sadness, with pain and hurt. He stopped teaching and called the woman to come over to him. There in the synagogue, in front of it, all the people, Jesus looked into her sad eyes and said, God loves you, and I love you. Then the woman felt Jesus' hands on her shoulder, and slowly she began to straighten up. Let's see if I can make the puppet do it. Yeah. yeah. You are set free, said Jesus gently. Slowly she straightened her back until finally she was standing up straight and tall. With God's love, Jesus helped the woman. I can see the sun. Praise God, she yelled. I can try and count the stars in the sky, she laughed. I am free from being bent. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus, she shouted. Praise God. Praise God. Now I invite Judy forward to do the reading of scripture. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as our scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. The scripture reading for today is Luke chapter 17, verses 10 through 17. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you were set free from your ailment. When he laid hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it to give lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for eighteen long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So Deuteronomy 5, 12 to 15, reads this about the Sabbath day, and it's almost identical in Exodus uh, where the Ten Commandments also appear. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 5, 12 to 15. Observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day it is, is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male or female slave or your ox, or your donkey, or any of your livestock, or the resident alien in your towns, so that your male and female slave may rest as well as you. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So it's a commandment. And what is it about? It's really in Deuteronomy and also in Exodus, it's about rest and liberation from slavish toil. It's really a liberative moment, not a binding moment. 
So it's interesting how we humans do, <laughs> we build up kind of what, well, in Judaism, it's called a hedge around the law. So here's the law, and then you do even more just to be sure you don't violate the law. So I understand the impulse of that. It's a very human impulse, right? Um, but it, I think the spirit of the law is what Jesus is talking about here, not necessarily the, the letter of the law. So Jesus and the Sabbath um, in Luke 6, 1 to 11, Jesus is kind of a, has kind of a, a reputation around the Sabbath. So this, um, this moment in, in the synagogue with the bent over woman isn't the first time in Luke that Jesus has done something that has uh, angered um, the, the authorities. One Sabbath, while Jesus was going through some grain fields, his disciples plucked some heads of grain, rubbed them in their hands, and ate them. But some of the Pharisees said, Why are you doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Jesus answered, Have you not read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? How he entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat? and gave some to his companions, and he said to them, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Let me stop for a moment and just talk about that bread. Um, on the, on the uh, altar in the temple was a stack of bread and a, a goblet of wine, and only the priests were supposed to eat it. But when David and his companions were hungry, the priest gave them what's called showbread or the bread of presence. Interesting how communion is so close to that. Um, but, um, but Jesus is saying, he was reminding the Pharisees that even David ate the bread that was meant only for the priests, he and his men, when they were hungry. So hunger was the prevailing need there. And on another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught, and there was a man whose right hand was withered. The scribes and the Pharisees were watching him to see whether he would cure on the Sabbath, so they might find grounds to bring an accusation against him. But he knew what they were thinking, and he said to the man who had the withered hand, come and stand in the middle. He got up and stood there. Then Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath to save life or to destroy it? After looking around at all of them, you can imagine this moment. Everyone's quiet, watching what's going to happen. After looking around at all of them, Jesus said to him, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored. But they were filled with fury, some of the Pharisees. They were filled with fury and began discussing with one another what they might do to Jesus. So in that context from the book of Luke, we look at the woman in this story. We don't know her name. She's simply referred to as the bent over woman. In the blog post, Fixing Her Eyes in 2015, a woman named Tammy writes, the woman of Luke 13, 10 to 17 knew plenty about being ignored. Sick for 18 years, three descriptions are given of her. She has been crippled by a spirit or crippled in spirit. She's bent over and she's unable to straighten up. However we think of it, her condition is clearly more than physical. This is a woman permanently bowed before all people. In fact, the word for bent over is often used in the New Testament to speak of those who are disadvantaged. She is the lowest of the low, the least worthy of others, time or energy. How heartbreaking. My first two experiences with bent over women, in 1983, I, uh, I got to go to Japan. My uh, friend was working on Tokyo Disneyland and we got to go for the family opening it was really fun. Um, so, um, but in Kyoto, we traveled around, of course, and in Kyoto, um, there was a little woman, and she was really tiny, and obviously I'm not really tiny. <laughs> and um, she was bent over like this. 
And when I passed her, I passed her very slowly. She just moved her head like this to kind of look at me. And I thought, man, that's got to be a hard way to live. That's got to be a really hard way to live, to be so small and so bent over and have to turn your head in such an uncomfortable way to see anything. And the second was my grandfather's baby sister, Lois, who warned me when I was young to be sure and eat nutritious food. Her bent back and shoulders she blamed on malnutrition from childhood. The bent over woman represents those who are bent over physically, psychologically, and spiritually. Those who are vulnerable among us, who can barely move, let alone easily fend for themselves. Somehow Luke sees fit to tell us that this bent over woman has had this affliction for 18 years. In this 18th year, perhaps, it is time for her to regain her chai, or life. Remember that um, the song from Fiddler in the Roof, Lechaim? Chai means life, to life. And it, the number of the um, word is 18. So in other words, um, one letter is worth is 10, the 10th letter, and one letter is the 8th letter. So the number 18 is um, synonymous with the word life. And numerically, the words consist of, here we go, the 8th and the 10th letters of the Hebrew alphabet, het and yud, adding up to the number 18, which is also the word chai. There is a deep connection drawn upon the word chai, its meaning life, and the numerical value of the letters comprising this word. Shiva.com uh, reports, traditionally the Jewish religion, similar to many other religions and cultures, places an emphasis on the significance of life. As such, the literal translation of the word chai to life is meaningful on its face, but in addition, Individuals who observe Judaism or identify with the religion are generally guided by the basic principles which include characteristics such as kindness, thoughtfulness, selflessness, and remaining good-natured both morally and ethically during life on earth. It's also a number that if you, if you have a Jewish friend, they might give you um, $18 for your birthday or $32, $36, sorry, in, in increments of 18 to symbolize this connection to life. So this woman has made her way to the synagogue after these 18 years. Um, we know from the number 18 that um, something is gonna happen, and we also know that she has suffered long years with this issue. We can surmise that this woman comes each week, but we can also guess that perhaps she has come in some expectation of hearing Jesus since he's been invited to speak at the synagogue that day. And as he teaches, he sees this woman, and how can he help but act on her behalf? He's not afraid of her condition. He's not afraid of the fact that she's a woman and he's about to address her in front of everyone. He's not afraid of so-called religious laws. His compassion overrides any of the risks involved in reaching out to her. He goes to her and says, woman, you are set free from your infirmity. He doesn't even ask her any questions. He just tells her right out, you are set free from your infirmity no strings attached. Suddenly this woman who has been bent over double for 18 long years begins to stand up slowly. She immediately recognizes that this is the hand of God and she begins to shout out, hallelujah, hallelujah. She's praising God. She understands that this is a gift from God, a gift of spirit, a gift of life from God. And she's just full of praise at this healing. Compassion is at the heart of the Sabbath. Healing is not work, it's restoration to wholeness. The entire point, as I understand it, of Sabbath rest and fellowship with the Spirit of God and one another. Now the leader of the synagogue says, we are not to work on the Sabbath, and Jesus says, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it to water? 
And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? And when he said this, all his opponents were put to shame. Right? This is not a popular opinion. And you can imagine what his opponents feel being put to shame. They're a little bit angry and frustrated, especially given the fact that Jesus continues this healing on the Sabbath business that he's already been told is not to be done. And I want to say the pressure on the Pharisees was to keep everything calm and copacetic so that the Romans did not come in and take over. As long as they kept their religion to themselves and paid their taxes, they were under the peace of Rome, right? Right? But now in this time, Jesus seems to be upsetting the apple cart, and the Pharisees are nervous about that. So we can ascribe to them not only the idea that they were upset, that the laws that they had set were being broken, but that they were fearful of the Romans. But Jesus had so much compassion on this woman that he couldn't help but help her. So let's break it down. Healing and liberation, not merely the following the letter of the law, is essential. The woman's relationship to God is revealed. She praises God in the sanctuary just as she should. This week I was in a, a workshop about blind spots. It's an anti-bias workshop. And blind spots are where we don't see what we don't see, right? And we learned, about, and it's um, black-centric, so I was one of the few white people there. So that's also very interesting, right, to have the tables turned and, um, and be the person in the room who, whose experience is not centered. Um, but very, very good for, for me and, and helped me learn a lot. But one of the things we talked about in that room uh, on Thursday is the concept of othering. And we human beings do it like that. Um, when I was in Japan um, and the, the small woman, the small bent over woman turned her head to look at me, it was because I was other, something different. Um, a white person, a big, tall, white woman. And so she was curious. And, um, and that's sort of natural. But we other in different ways, too. Um, this, just this morning, I was reading a news article where a man who um, studies bias in um, appra home appraisal actually had his own house appraised, right? Black man. And his house was worth $450,000. Then they took out everything that um, could point to blackness and his white friend came in, and his house was appraised at $650,000. So apparently whiteness is worth $200,000 of home value. We have these biases, and, we, and we, we have so little time to really stop and reflect about it, which is what I so appreciated about this Thursday morning group. And uh, I get to meet with them once a month for the next few months to do this kind of anti-racism, anti-bias work, and I'm so honored um, to do that work, and I so need it. We all do. Um, but this concept of othering we've done in our society so long and so thoroughly that it's ingrained in us. And so, and we also do something called saming, which is pretending we're all the same when we're not, right? We all have unique experiences, and we all have some shared experiences with people who are like us, but in order to find out who the person in front of us is, we really need to look at them with compassion and let go of all our preconceived notions and really think through um, our ideas that come along with preconceived ideas, right? So, what is the opposite of saming and othering? Belonging. Belonging is the opposite. And belonging is what the beloved community, what the, the kingdom or kingdom of God is all about. It's all about belonging 
to God and to each other. And so friends, we really need to work on our othering and our saming and our, all our ings, so to speak, and really figure out how we can overcome our biases. Not everyone who has a condition that makes them feel other needs to be healed. I want to talk about that. It needs to be cured, I should say. Jesus cures this bent-over woman, but just because one is not cured doesn't mean that they are something is wrong with them spiritually, which a lot of people think. If you just had faith enough, you wouldn't have those physical problems. And what I like to say is, if I live long enough, I will be a bent-over woman. If I live long enough, I won't see or hear very well. If I live long enough, I'm going to need those curb cuts like to get my walker up up and down, and I'm going to need access. So the way that we can stop othering people is to make them welcome in ways that we might not think of or in ways that might take us out of our, um, our efficient way of thinking. So what I mean by that is we've commodified time. The Sabbath is all about uncommodifying time. The Sabbath is about making time sacred and time spent with God and with each other in fellowship and in belonging. So we need to think of time as, a, as time with one another because the truth is we don't know how much time we have. And so in order to make it count, loving each other, accepting each other, um, helping one another out, taking the time. Like um, <laughs> yesterday on the 405, another one of my famous freeway stories, um, I was driving down the 405 and someone on the left needed, wanted to come into the right lane. And I, they almost had enough room, so I just paused for a second. And the big old truck behind me went, burp. <laughs> I'm like, we're all going like 20 miles an hour. Why is that a big deal? Clearly, the person in the truck behind me was in a hurry and frustrated. Time to them was money instead of relationship. And that's what I hope for us, that we can find the time. Like when you're in the grocery supermarket line and you're in a hurry, it's hard to be compassionate to the person who's counting out change in front of you. But if we can take the time we need with one another, and if we can be uh, compassionate to one another above the quote-unquote law, we can really become a community of belonging and love. Healing and liberation, not merely following the letter of the law here, is essential. And the woman's relationship to God is revealed. She praises God in the sanctuary just as she should. How can we be together with one another where we can meet each other's needs, bear one another's burdens, open up to one another, and give one another the love that we so need as human beings? God has no hands and feet but ours on this earth. So I invite us all to start thinking about Sabbath time. And, um, and, and efficiency is important in some moments, but in other moments, it's important to take time, to make time, to be patient and loving and kind with each other. Have you ever walked around a block with a little kid? Takes forever. <laughs> because they have to stop and look at everything. So it's not really so much exercise as it is noticing things. And the Buddhists would say that's why the Buddha is a laughing baby, because they're in the moment. They're in the moment with one another and compassionate. So friends, this bent over woman, she is in some way each of us whether it be physical, spiritual, psychological, 
or social. And with compassion and seeing her for who she is, Jesus heals her. And with compassion and seeing us for who we are, Jesus heals us. And we can be Jesus' instruments in healing one another by truly seeing each other, by taking time to be with each other, by belonging, not othering. Amen? Amen. Okay, um, now we have our prayers of the people. So let us pray. God, we come before you as a people in need of healing, of restoration of right relationship to you and to each other. Lord, we pray this is in the world where people are suffering under, under the consequences of climate change. In France, where the big river has dried up. In, in the west of the United States of America, which has burned incessantly. In the Middle West and the East Coast, where floods are so prevalent. For all the places around the world where the waters are rising and taking up archipelagos and islands. Lord God, help us to be people who look toward taking time rather than a people of convenience that we may help to stem the tide of climate change and all the heartbreak that comes from it. And Lord, we lift up to you the places in the world where there are wars and famine. We lift up to you the nation of Ukraine. May there be peace, Lord, soon. Protect us from harm. Lord, help us to be people of peace in our hearts and minds, as well as in our intentions. Almighty God, we pray for peace. And Lord God, for people all over the world, regardless of their faith or no faith, touch their hearts, Lord, with compassion, with your compassion. Fill the earth with your peace that we might live together as brothers and sisters, as siblings in your name as we pray the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Now please offer your financial gifts to God. is 
Let's rise for our closing song.
the light of Christ goes forth, remember that you belong to Christ, that we belong to Christ, and that in Christ there is healing, love, and compassion. In the name of God, the Creator, God the Savior, and God the Holy Spirit, amen. Your grace is